Hello, everyone. Today on the show, I'm joined by Todd Campbell from EB Capital Markets. Todd does a great job of scanning through the equity universe, looking for opportunities. He's going to tell us about the broad market, but also about a particular group you should be paying a little bit of extra attention to. This is on a day when the S&P really was choppy. It really fluctuated around. It's after yesterday's rally into the sell-off going into the close. Today it was more chopping around, finished negative, but really not following through one way or the other. So the question is, which way is next? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we look at these markets together through the lenses of technical analysis, behavioral finance, quantitative methods, investor psychology, sentiment, breadth, whatever we can, uh, whatever we can do to try to uh, evaluate and make sense of the, uh, of the very difficult <laughs> to, uh, to make sense of things, which are the markets. Um, you know, the S&P really chopped around today, and, uh, and, and it's interesting, in that context, there are groups that are working. We're going to talk about one of those later. There are groups that are not working. You know, biotech, we talked about Amgen yesterday and how it's starting to break down a little bit. Other things, other asset classes certainly work. We're going to focus a little bit on cryptocurrencies today because a big announcement from PayPal causing Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, all of these uh, rallying pretty well. So we're going to look from a technical perspective, see what they kind of mean and, uh, and what sort of levers you may want to think about pulling in your own uh, in your own portfolio. So a lot of really good content to come today. Uh, we have a great guest today, Todd Campbell, coming back on the show. It's always a pleasure to talk to him about what he's seeing in his work. Tomorrow, we'll focus a little bit on sentiment. We have Mark Young from WallStreetSentiment.com. Coming up next week, we have Sam Stovall from CFRA Research. On, uh, on uh, Tuesday, the 27th, uh, Ralph Akinpora, my friend and mentor, first introduced me to Sam years ago. And uh, he is just a knowledgeable uh, guy about, uh, about the macro environment. And I love relating what he says to what I'm seeing on the charts. And then on Wednesday, the 28th, we have Jeff Greenblatt from Lucas Wave International. So some really good guests uh, coming on the show here to uh, share their wisdom and uh, challenge you to think a little bit outside of, uh, of your normal toolkit. When we think about the markets today, again, I, I think the, the overall sentiment, we talked with my, my guest yesterday, uh, Jeff Hughes, we were talking about just this binary potential outcome, right? There's a potential. You can make a case for, for stocks going higher from here from a technical perspective. You can also make a case for things going weaker. And I think the key to that was it's all about the triggers, right? It's all about what sort of direction you see uh, with the momentum of what's happening. If you were looking for confirmation or you're looking for clarity today, I don't think you got it because we sort of closed not far from where we closed yesterday. We chopped around most of the day. The first, you know, out of the gates, it felt uh, a little stronger, but very quickly went net negative. And in the end, really chopped around this range from around 34, 35, which is where we ended up, up to around 34, 60 on the, uh, on the upper end of it. So the S&P down just under a quarter of a percent. Mid caps and small caps down a little more. So again, that small cap as a weather vane of sorts for the overall market, if that's one thing you're looking at, uh, certainly finished uh, at the lows of the day and below the zero line. The NASDAQ 100 was probably the, the best of this uh, group, just down a, a token amount. Very quickly on some other asset classes, bonds were down in the form of the TLT, down a third of a percent. Uh, Ten-year yields uh, continuing to creep higher, now over 80 basis points, or 0.8%. So it's interesting to see how this is uh, yields increasing. And uh, again, earlier this week, I was interviewed and, and asked about rising yields and, and what that might what that might mean. So I think that's a, if that's not something you've been thinking about for a while, it may be something you want to consider uh, reflecting on and seeing how that might impact your, uh, your holdings. Gold and silver up uh, probably the most today, uh, you know, positive. Uh, the commodities as a whole were a little weaker. And we talked about the DBC yesterday as one of our three and three charts. Oil was really the, the story there because it's a big weight in the DBC. Some of the other more equal weighted measures of commodities weren't as negative, but if you had an energy uh, weighting, which, uh, which the DBC and uh, the CRB index do, they weighted down pretty bad. Now, if you look at the sector returns, energy down the most, followed by industrials, consumer discretionary, actually kind of an outlier down at the bottom of the list here. On the top, you have communication services up pretty big. And so you have this sort of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, real outliers with comm services up, 
1.7%, energy down 1.8%. Everything else is kind of chopping around in the middle, kind of middle to down for the, uh, for the day. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500 to talk about some of the, the big picture themes. So as we've been talking about for a while now, I think we're, you know, overall, we've confirmed a very significant support level around 3,200, 3,250. That really started back here in June. And when that was the, the big, uh, the rally into the June high, this is sort of a, you know, transition of sorts as we saw some potential new leadership come in, the FANG trade started to lighten up a little bit, and we sort of retested and broke it out. And then you had this reemergence of tech and uh, consumer pushing uh, the market to, uh, you know, toward the 3600 level, but that level 3200, 3250 has been significant for a while. It's not surprising that that's where we found support when we came down in, uh, in late September. So, you know, as we've now rallied near the highs, we've failed so far to, uh, to retest those highs. We topped out at this point, really within the day's range on the, uh, on the high day. So overall, you could classify that a, a double top of sorts, because we're sort of in that same Range. The question is where from where from now. In terms of short term, you know, support. I think we're right at that first one. These are the swing highs from early September. We've now tested those a couple days in a row. Um, so I think we're right at a very key support level. The 50-day moving average, sort of within a rounding error, right there. If we would break that, you're down into the 3350 range, which is a level support from earlier in this uh, in this two-month cycle. If we would break that, you're really looking at the 3200 low. So at this point, I think until we break to new swing highs, until we break to new swing lows. And that means before 3,200, you're really sort of in this, in this range. And either this becomes validated as a breakout pattern where we don't retest the lows, we break to, uh, to new swing highs, or we break down through 3,200. And then you have to really think about the potential for further downside risk uh, from there. So really, I, I think that, you know, the, the concern I have as a trend follower thinking of a longer term uptrend is just the, the, the extent of potential, uh, potential upside. Also, as we mentioned in the end, in that presidential cycle special on uh, on Monday, and if you missed that, go to our YouTube channel. Um, you know, we talked about the the seasonal tendencies, and October tends to be a little weaker. November, December, even during election years, even during this particular pattern going back over time, actually tends to be pretty uh, pretty strong, regardless of who. Uh, of who wins or uh, or does not win uh, November December tend to be pretty pretty good so that may mean we we sort of come down and 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 back and fill in this range before resumption of the uptrend uh, we'll have to see what the uh, what the charts tell us let's keep looking here at the uh, actually I wanted to switch over and just look very quickly at at the breadth characteristics so we talked uh, last week had a, a whole episode focused on uh, on breadth. So if you missed that one, that's a good video to uh, to watch. Uh, but here, one of the main ways we tend to look at breadth is looking at the advanced decline lines, the cumulative advanced decline lines. And, you know, one of the key pieces of that potential retest the highs thesis were these advanced decline lines that were able to break above their highs from uh, earlier, uh, sort of late summer, early fall. So you had uh, the August highs eclipsed on the S&P advanced decline line and the mid cap advanced decline line. We never broke above those highs on the small cap uh, advanced decline line and the common stock only New York Stock Exchange AD line. So the fact that these hit resistance and never really broke out is a bit of a concern. It's sort of a non-confirmation there. Now you have the mid cap index actually testing that same breakout level potentially coming back uh, in this range. So again, the advanced decline lines and the S&P actually have a pretty high positive correlation, meaning they tend to move in lockstep with one another. But there's some notable times where you get divergences. And I think one of the things you may look at, uh, you know, going forward here is if you start to get some bearish divergences with, you know, the market holding up or trying to move a little higher and the AD lines not confirming that. At this point, we just have some of them breaking out and some of them not breaking out, which is uh, the uh, the area of concern. Also thought it was interesting looking at the new highs and new lows. About two weeks ago on, a, on that Friday show, we were wrapping the week, or it might have been on a Monday show when we were you know, talking about the macro environment. I remember focusing on the increasing number of new highs. And this is as the s and rallying out of the late September lows, kind of pushing back up. And the question is, are we going to retest the early September highs? And the fact that there was a steady increase in the number of new highs was super encouraging because that tells you, even though the S&P had not quite made a new high, there were plenty of individual stocks more and more that were actually able to do so. And it's the, you know, Costco's and others that were able to, uh, to break out. What's happened since then is you've seen a rotation back down. So as the S&P's pulled back, a lot of individual stocks have pulled back. You don't have as many names making new highs. It's just a handful of stocks. Uh, and so what it's telling you is that, you know, stocks are not just continuing higher. Everything's sort of taking a break right now. So it really is a you know, sort of a, uh, a pause, sort of a digestion phase, what I usually call a big move. And then you sort of chop around for a little bit. It's sort of, we've hit an equilibrium. We sort of agreed 
where this market should be. And now it's just sort of backing and filling, uh, taking a break and, uh, and seeing which way we would, uh, we would go from there. So those are a couple of breadth charts that I think could be pretty interesting to, uh, to watch here. Just very quickly to finish up, Netflix, a big mover to the downside. Again, we rarely have time to go through individual stocks and what's moved, but a big cap name, part of that, you know, um, fan mag, uh, maga, fang trade, whatever you want, would like to call it. Um, one of the big mega cap stocks that we've all been following, uh, gapping down like it, it has today is, uh, is pretty significant. So out of all of the large cap universe, Netflix is the biggest loser in terms of its relative uh, scooter ranking. So it lost the most in the uh, scooter rankings relative to, uh, to other, uh, other stocks. So maybe worth digging into that a little bit, just thinking about defining your, you know, your risk parameters, where you'd, uh, where you feel comfortable with some of these. KeyBank is another one. Again, we, again, we don't have time to go through a lot of these, but we talk about the challenge with financials. I'm, I'm often asked things like financials. Should we, you know, should we be looking at that because it's, it hasn't performed as well as others. And if things are going to do well, wouldn't that group start to, participate. And I think what you've seen with the XLF, what you've seen with Key Corp, with some of the big banks, Key Corp is a regional bank uh, based in the Midwest. You see now a potential failure here at the 200-day moving average. It tested it from below, now gapping back below the 50-day moving average today. So, you know, some weakness that I'm seeing uh, on some of these names that if things are great and if things are continuing to improve, you'd want to see some of these stocks doing a little bit better. We're certainly not seeming to see it uh, on today's uh, action. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with my guest, Todd Campbell. We'll see you in a minute. everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Really appreciate you watching the show every weekday after the close. I want to remind you, we love to hear from you, particular questions that you're running into as you go through your own process of reviewing the charts, trying to understand these markets and trade individual, uh, tra individual names, individual ETFs. You can get your questions to us via email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com, on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, or on our YouTube channel, just put a comment right below the video. We'll capture all those. And then we'll do another mailbag segment at the end of this week. We'd love to answer one of your questions on the air. I want to welcome on my guest back to the show, Todd Campbell from EB Capital Markets. Todd's based in, uh, in New England. Uh, I followed Todd's work uh, for a number of years when I was on the institutional buy side and have really valued his perspective, really doing a, a pretty thorough bottom-up process. Uh, so, Todd, welcome back to the show. Dave, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So, you know, we, I think of you as really a, a, a bottom up stock picker. And I know we're going to get to one of the groups on uh, top of mind for you soon. But you're actually starting us more on the macro level thinking about uh, the S&P relative to the long term trend. What, what tell us about this chart? Well, one of the reasons that I love charts is it put, helps you put things into context and gives you a little bit of perspective. And one of the things that I've been asked a lot about is, geez, Todd, you know, isn't the market overheated? You know, it, it, we're, look how extended we are. So I wanted to go back just for everybody and take a look and see, you know, is it really rare that we get this extended after that bear market low in, uh, in March? And, you know, what this chart is showing us is that, no, it's, it's really not that rare at all, Dave. I mean, if, if you look back to 2008, 2000, the, the March low of 2009, um, you know, you can see how extended the low we were of the 200-day moving average. We're more than 30% below the 200-day moving average on the S&P 500 ETF, SPY. And then we rallied significantly off of that March low. And then right around June, Dave, when we got up to about, you know, double digits, 10, 15%, and we ran there for about six months. I think the average was about 13.9% above the 200-day moving average between June of 2009 and December of 2009. And if you look at just over time, obviously, the 200-day moving average will catch up. You know, and, and you know, over the course of the last decade, I think it's averaged about 4% above the 200-day moving average across that entire span of that chart. Um, and then you can see where we are on the far right of the chart today. And you can say, okay, yeah, we came off of a bear market low again um, in March. And now we've rallied up to the double digits above the 200-day moving average. 
So it's not that, I guess it's not that abnormal, Dave, for us to, to look at the market and say, yeah, we can run hot for a little while. Um, and then eventually the 200 day moving average will catch up. You talked about digestion in the top half of the show. And, you know, maybe that's what we're seeing now. We're going to see some chop and we're going to see some digestion and, you know, some sideways trading. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think that investors should be looking at this and saying, oh, this is really abnormal. Um, I've got to get out just because the market appears to be extended. It, you know, it's so funny. I feel like when people see or think about how extended we might be, they imagine sort of this sort of drop, right? It's like they, they imagine, all right, it's all of a sudden going to go 20% below because obviously that's what would have to happen to, you know, to correct this, uh, this overextended condition. But if you look back in, you know, 2013 to 14 to 15, there, there are periods where we'll remain above a long-term moving average for extended periods of time, right? During a, during a longer bull market. So it's not guaranteeing we have to move severely in one direction or the other. It could just be just a normal, a normal uh, positive phase, I guess, right? Absolutely. Nine to 18 months of, of basically a trending tape where you're trending up and you're just, you know, so I, so I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity. I would not, I wouldn't certainly wouldn't be selling the market solely because of where the S&P happens to be trading right now relative to the 200. That's a great point. Now, uh, when, we, when we talked ahead of time, you brought a group with you, and this is a, a group that I know we've talked about on the show. It's a, sort of a bellwether group. It sort of gives you a good read on the environment. Talk us through this visualization uh, on semiconductors. All right. So one of, the, one of the components of the model that we have to try and you know, filter down our 1,500 stocks to an actual number of stocks, uh, one of those factors is seasonality. And what I like to do is I'd like to try and find an edge wherever I can find it. And seasonality, I've found does indeed give me an edge. And what seasonality is telling us right now is that it might be a good time to increase your exposure to semiconductor stocks. So the visualization that you have up on the screen right now is just showing over a 10 year period from 2004 to 2014 as context again, what the book to bill ratio, monthly book to bill ratio is. And for listeners who aren't familiar with what the book to bill, that's simply orders divided by orders filled. So if you've got a reading that's above one or near one, that's bullish, right? And if you have readings that are lower, that would be more bearish. And one of the things that you can see here is just that tendency for orders to start to ramp up in the fall, September, October being kind of that bottom, that tro, and then improving through November, December, January, and then peaking out as we get into the second quarter. So I think that, you know, historically, just if you look at, the nature of things, when do orders come in and then when would they be filled? You're coming into a relatively sweet spot for um, semiconductor stocks. And I just want to tag on to that. We don't have the visualization, visualization here, but I want to tag on to that. If you just look at the ETF, Dave, the uh, XSD, okay. that's been up in nine of the past 10 years in the fourth, fourth quarter. Hmm. So, you know, there is, there's, there's reason to think that the book to build does carry over to the individual stock performance or the stock performance for the entire basket. Very, very interesting. And it's interesting how that seasonality actually lines up pretty well with uh, seasonality for the markets overall. And it brings to mind the sell and may go away and how we're entering into that seasonally stronger part of the year. We only have about 30 seconds left, but I did want to get to an individual name. You sent, you had a couple ideas you were talking about, but Applied Materials is, is a name that I know many have, uh, have tried to evaluate. Give us the quick take on, uh, on this stock. Yeah, I think we might be getting a little bit of a cup and handle here. We'll have to see whether or not I can hold uh, right in here and build off of it. Um, if you look at that August to yeah, September and then up through the October, that being the cup, and then maybe you're forming that handle right now that you can rally off of. I think LAM Research reports their numbers on Thursday. Depending on how they do, that could also impact how applied materials trades. That could also impact KLA 10 core as well. KLA C is another one. Uh, that's intriguing. It's a fantastic take. Uh, Todd, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Good to hear from you. Hope you and your family stay safe and we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks, Dave. We'll talk soon. That's Todd Campbell from EB Capital Markets uh, based in New England. Uh, again, I, what I love about Todd's work is it really is a bottom-up process, but he crunches through more data in a day than I probably get to in, in a month, I feel like, uh, but he's able to uncover some really interesting themes. And I love that visualization looking at the S&P relative to its 200 day, just because a lot of times when things get overextended, when they get overbought, I hear people, I think, incorrectly assume just because it's gone up a lot means it needs to come off quickly and come down a lot. And that's not necessarily 
um, the case. That, that on its own should not be a reason to uh, necessarily change your uh, positioning. Our next segment's called Crypto Corner, and uh, you know we on, on Wednesdays we usually rotate what kind of things we're gonna we're gonna get into. But you know what what, what happened just recently in the last 24 hours? News out of uh, PayPal basically acknowledging that they're gonna start accepting uh, Bitcoin and uh, and cryptocurrencies as payment uh, for buying and selling using their platform using PayPal, um, and also that you actually be able to uh, incorporate your you know uh, crypto accounts into uh, into PayPal. And I think they particularly mentioned Bitcoin. I don't. Um, I, mean, I don't know a lot of the details it's worth, that it would be worth reviewing, but, uh, but certainly the entire crypto space up pretty good today. And the way you can see that is on our member dashboard. If you go to your dashboard in the market overview section, you'll see we have four categories and we don't usually go to the crypto one, but I'm showing you there today. We start with Bitcoin, which is here and you can see it's up almost 7% today, but you can see the other, uh, you know, the nine uh, next most common or most liquid uh, cryptocurrencies. All of these are tickerized. So if you click on one of them, you'll see the ticker there. You can bring those up on any chart run, whatever technical indicators you might want to uh, want to evaluate. But that's a really good, quick uh, quick way to uh, to access some of these. You can also incorporate all of them into our ACP platform uh, as well. So Bitcoin up pretty good today. At this point, up about six and a half percent. It almost hit thirteen thousand a little earlier today. This is a big move out of uh, you know what has really been a longer term base. And as this base has evaluated, and when I talk about a base, I'm, I'm looking at the last, you know, two years here. And when you go back to sort of mid-2019, this was that huge run up into the peak uh, of Bitcoin, uh, just below 14,000 here in, uh, in June of last year. From there, it really started to come off. And then the big, uh, the big drop was into the, uh, the, the March uh, market low. And, and I think during this period, I think a lot of, uh, you know, Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies really haven't been battle tested a lot. And by battle tested, I mean, put through the ringer of a raging bear market and see what actually happens. And what was interesting is, you know, if you were looking for uh, divergence, if you're looking for, um, you know, uh, diversification by buying cryptocurrencies going into the March low, it certainly didn't work out particularly well. It sort of, it sort of came off with all the other risk assets for the most part coming into the low in, uh, in March. Since then, though, you can see that Bitcoin's been uh, been steadily, steadily improving. And now if you look at the last, you know, 18 months or so, you really see this big, broad base. And what I mean by that is a peak. We're now retesting, getting back up to that level, sort of in the 13,000 range, uh, which is where we first topped out here in, uh, in the summer of 2019. We've had this huge, huge uh, basing pattern, meaning, you know, a, a, a rotation around uh, back up to that resistance level. And so here's the way this tends to work. If we would get above out of this uh, basing pattern, if we would really break above 14,000 from a technical perspective, we call that a big base breakout. And, uh, and some analysts made a career out of identifying these. Bill Doan comes to mind, who was one of my predecessors at Fidelity. He uh, had his own research firm called Minuteman uh, Research, if I remember right, before he passed away, and, uh, and used to just still identify big base breakouts. He would be he is loving these wherever he is now because it's just a, it's this beautiful multi, you know, year plus basing pattern breaking above the upside. So here, you know, how do you think about this? I think you have to separate the short term and the long term. In the short term, the reality is Bitcoin has come up a lot. And if you look back to where we've had an RSI, you know, just nearing the 80 level, the last two times that has happened, once was in mid uh, 2020 there in, uh, in the May area. We also did again in sort of late July into early uh, uh, August. You can see both of those times we sort of chopped around a little bit. The uptrend took a pause. So here, you know, we went from 12,000 down to 10,000 before we resumed. Uh, here in April, we got up to uh, just around 10,000 and came off uh, before resuming the uptrend. So it would not be unreasonable at some point in the coming weeks to get a bit of a pullback and, and logical pullback levels would be to some of the previous levels. So you can see here in April, we pulled back and broke above it there in, in, uh, in August, September, we pulled back to that same 10,000 level. So if we would come down, sort of that 12,000 range seems pretty reasonable if we would sort of uh, make our way back down. But overall from there, I think you may be setting up for, uh, for potential for further upside. What would invalidate that thesis? Well, the challenge with something like Bitcoin is you have a lot of room below. If you think from a risk reward perspective, the reward is the potential upside. And I think if we break above 14,000, the upside for Bitcoin is certainly extremely high over the long term. There, there's no reason why it couldn't be theoretically. The downside risk is what concerns me now because we're, we're up so much relative to where we've been. And if we would roll over, 
um, you know, you have to start thinking about some of the the the, uh, the downside potential. And there's a lot of room going back to some of these uh, some of these previous lows. It's interesting with Bitcoin, and when you think about um, you know a relatively newer market, and and to be honest, I mean, many of us have tried to make sense of Bitcoin. I, I think we're all sort of learning what this asset looks like as it as it evolves, but. I'm keying in on the 10,000 level. That's where this red horizontal line is. Look at how many times over the last 18 months that that 10,000 level was incredibly important. Once we broke down there in 2019, look at how often we came back up to that same resistance. When we finally broke out, that was a definite a, a signal for potential upside. And look at when we came back down, we hit that same 10,000 level. So if and when we would come down, I think your downside risk of about 28% right now takes us down to 10,000. That's the swing lows from uh, over the summer of this year. That's also the 200 day moving average. I think that would be pretty much well defining your downside risk with the upside potential being uh, pretty, pretty high relative to where we're at. So overall, short term extended to the upside potentially, but, uh, but long term, certainly potential for, uh, for further upside. I just want to leave with one other. Again, we don't have time to go through all of these uh, cryptocurrencies. Again, I'd encourage you to do some of your own chart analysis uh, as you can using the tickers that we have. But if you look at Ethereum, you'll see a bit of a different take. If you look at this range here from uh, 2019, this is where it topped out. You can see we again broke above around the 3, 325 level, broke above there in the, in the summers about when Bitcoin broke out, came back and retested those same low. So now you have sort of a pretty good support level around 315, 320, which would define your uh, your downside risk. And if we break out, you've got upside in the short term to 480. So from a short term risk reward level, potentially setting up uh, a little better. And this is coming off the RSI being right around 40, which is pretty classic for a pull out, uh, pullback within, a, uh, within an overall uptrend. It's all the time we have for crypto, current, uh, crypto corner, but I did want to point out, just given the news, I think the upside for, for something like Bitcoin certainly is uh, it has upside potential. The question now is just defining that short-term risk. You can see it being uh, pretty overextended as there have been plenty of buyers of Bitcoin uh, on this news. I think other things like Ethereum may present a better uh, risk reward purely from a technical perspective. We need to wrap the show and go right to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Let's get to it. Chart number one is looking at the S&P 500 and the bullish percent index. This is part of our breadth package. And so when we dig into breadth, we'll get to this. This is very uh, simply, if I can define it, uh, is essentially looking at the S&P 500 uh, members, what percent of them have had a, 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 a point and figure buy signal, which is where you have a column of X's and then another column of X's that breaks to a new high. And if you don't understand the sentence I just uttered, go to our chart school and read up on point and figure charting. You'll find what I, what I mean by that. This basically rolls up 500 point and figure charts into one, and it shows you what percent of them are in a bull phase versus a bear phase. It broke above 70% about a week and a half ago, and now it's rotating back down below it. And if we get a sell signal, which has not quite happened, it would have to move about another percent lower. You'd have what's called a, a, a bear alert, which is where it goes into the, uh, the uh, you know, above 70 range and then comes back down. If you look, the last time that happened was right after the September high, and it usually suggests some short-term weakness in the coming weeks. It happened uh, as well there in, uh, in June. So something to look for on the uh, point and figure chart of the bullish percent index. Chart number two is energy. And we talked uh, you know, with my guest yesterday, Jeff Huge, about energy. And, uh, and, and I mentioned on the show, I, I think you know, there's a reason when prices go down, there is a reason why prices have gone down. And, and, is, and I know some are value investors and would be interested in, in charts that are, have shown extreme weakness. I am much more of a trend follower. I would be excited about energy if you show some signs of accumulation. The reason why I think it's an interesting chart now, it, it is in a downtrend. It has remained in a downtrend of lower highs and lower lows. We just, though, made a new swing high. And if we would make a new swing low, and then uh, you know, start to have an improvement in relative strength, I could potentially start to see the technical argument, but boy, not yet. Chart number three is the biotechnology index. Just like the semiconductors, I think are setting up very well for potential upside. I agree with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Todd's take earlier. I would say a bit of a warning on biotech. We talked about Amgen yesterday, and I think the BTK, the biotech index, is a chart to watch as it tests its 200-day moving average below their 5,100 is a clear support level in the relative strength, potentially making a new eight or nine week relative low. That's our show for today. I want to thank Todd Campbell from EB Capital Markets for joining us today. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.